So uh, I just want to give you a little background about myself. My name is Tony Dofat. I'm from a small town in New York called Mount Vernon. That town, uh, also from that town is Heavy D, Pete Rock and Seal Smooth, uh, I'll Be Sure, P. Diddy, uh, Denzel Washington, a bunch of us are from that small town. So we all knew each other. I started making music. I was around maybe uh, 19, 20, but my next door neighbor knew that I was making music. And he was the first person and the only person that I ever knew that worked at an actual record label. He worked at Uptown Records. So he came to me and he said, Tony, uh, I know this intern uh, that we just got, you know, and uh, he's looking for a partner to, to make music with. So uh, I, I hear your music and it's, not, it's incredible. And I said, really, it's, it's good? He said, yeah, your music is real good. But actually, you said the word dope. Your music is dope. <laughs> he said, I think uh, you, you guys should link up. I said, he said, you know who the guy is anyway. He's an intern, so let me link you guys up and see what happens. So we get into the studio. It was a hip factory in New York. And I looked, and the engineer was sitting there in the chair with all his long hair, with the black uh, Austin Power glasses. <laughs> and uh, the intern was sitting there. And then the, there was an artist sitting there. She was a female, just, you know, just sitting there in a the chair, spinning around in the chair. And you know, we were all little kids. Basically, we were like 21, 20 years old. And um, the intern says, so this is what we're gonna do. <clears throat> I, like, I like your style of hip hop and I like your style of R&B. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix the two because we're young, we love hip hop. The old people don't like hip hop, they complain. So we have to put singing on the hip hop and chords and all that music stuff and then I bet you they're gonna like it too. I said, okay, we have nothing to lose. I, I don't know. So um, he said, let's sample these drum sounds and let's you know, make a beat. And I did the beat. Then he said, now let's put chords in. There was a Korg M1. Anyone knows what a Korg M1 is? So that was the only keyboard there and I used that keyboard for every sound. And I did it and then the, uh, the artist, the female, went into the booth to sing the song. She did the vocals and came out. And uh, then the engineer guy with the long hair, he mixed it. And uh, next thing I know, two days later, I hear my song on the radio. Then I see that's when uh, the kids and everyone drove Jeeps, like the New Jack City era. So they're driving around with the Jeeps with the big speakers in the back. And I hear my song blasting in the Jeep. And I'm like, wow. I, I was really more enthused about that as opposed to being on the radio. Because I'm like, I'm a stranger to this guy, but he's playing my music. And the next thing I know, probably three weeks later, the intern calls me and says, come to the office. I go to the office, and he picks up a box with a gold plaque. And he says, congratulations. And I said, wow, the record is gold. I don't know what it means, but I'll take it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so three months later, the record goes platinum. Then he gives me another plaque. And then this was the beginning of the change of urban music, because the remix was then invented. So that intern that called me was Puff Daddy. The artist, the girl that was swinging around in the chair, that was Mary J. Blige. And that engineer with the long hair with the, with the glasses was Tony Maserati. So we all, started together and grew up together in the industry. And we had no idea what we would be doing. So it took a year or two for that to sink in. I didn't know. Then I started knowing what a producer does. I have to develop my ear. It's all about developing your ear and knowing what's hot and what's not hot. So at that point, the record was so hot 
And Andre Harrell was just so happy because he was the CEO of the label. He didn't care if he knew me or not. He was making money. He said, I want you to do What's the 411? Let's do the album. Great. I did What's the 411? It's five times platinum now. And then he said, do Heavy D, which was one of my best friends anyway. But I didn't work with Heavy until they said, I want you to produce them. So myself, Pete Rock, and DJ Premier, we produced Blue Funk, gold album, history. Then I did Jodeci. Then I did Christopher Williams. Then I did the entire remix album. Then I did Queen Latifah. Then I did Will Smith. Then I did Tina Turner. Then I did uh, Black Rob. Then I did, uh, then I became a member of uh, Bad Boy Hitman. And then I produced everyone. And here I am now, 25 years later, with 172 compositions. Now I know what a producer is. <laughs> and I wrote a book about it. So that's how I started. So I started with the greatest, and now he's on Forbes five years in a row, number one, and I would never think, because we were so broke. We were so broke, I had no idea. The guy, I used to sit in his car double parked because we could not pay for parking. And he said, I'm going to a meeting. I'll be right down in 10 minutes. And meanwhile, I'm three hours later sitting in the car falling asleep, and he's still upstairs in the meeting. And this guy is on Forbes magazine now. And I'm like, wow, I never knew. Only thing I knew about was music and my passion. And if I didn't have passion for music, I would not be here today. <clears throat> After my 172 songs, I did two co-publishing deals. I did one of the biggest co-publishing deals in history. And uh, my first, then I started getting into academia because I was offered to do a workshop at SAE in New York. <laughs> this was five years ago. And it doesn't stop there. And then I wrote these two wonderful books, <laughs> which <laughs> are very uh, helpful because I wish I had this coming up in the industry. I had to learn the hard way, and you won't have to go through that. And also, this is another course I teach, digital audio. These are courses that I actually wrote. I wrote these classes. Digital Audio 1, Digital Audio 2, I teach Sound Design 1 and 2, Business music, uh, business of Music Production also, and Audio Engineering. So that's how I ended up here today. I want to tell you one last story. I produced an artist named El DeBarge. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the DeBarge family, but they're legends, they're genius, yes. Uh, well, El DeBarge was mentored by Marvin Gaye. You guys know who Marvin Gaye is, correct? All right, so. He passed some things down to me from Marvin Gaye, and that was great. I was only, I wrote a song when I was 18, but I didn't get it published or covered until I was 24, and he actually picked the song. And it was a great song, and I, I'll probably, probably play it later. But he was in the booth. I wrote it 100%. I wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics. So he was in the booth singing, and uh, he did a line, and I said, no, nah, I cut it over again. He said, okay, I'm gonna try it again. He, he uh, re-sang the line. And I said, do it again, it's still a little off. He said, hold on, let me come out and talk to you for a second. He came out, and uh, you know, I was sitting down, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, you know Marvin Gaye mentored me, right? I said, yeah, I know that. He said, so let me, let me teach you something from Marvin Gaye. He said, close your eyes and listen to it. And I closed my eyes, and I listened to it, he said, how does it sound? I said, it still sounds a little off. <laughs> but, then, but then he said, now how does it feel? I said, it feels great. Then he patted me on the back. He says, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the feeling. If you feel it and it's off, leave it alone. And that's what we get from pre-2000, because now everyone is tuning their vocal with Melodyne. If not auto-tune, Melodyne. So that's another thing that's different. A lot of things different from today and yesterday's music. So, so like, so to speak, like these man-made artists? Yes. For like Justin Bieber or like Britney Spears or something? Yes, like, yeah, exactly. Like, on stage. like, we like flaws. Flaws are great. Diamonds, you, would, you want a diamond with a flaw it, it, because it's unique. You understand what I'm saying? 
It's unique. I want a little carbon in my diamond. I don't want it flawless. I want something so I can identify that it's mine. And that's the same thing with music. When you guys create music today, you want it to be unique. And that's the key to longevity. You don't want something stiff and you're walking around like a robot. You want people to feel loose and, and, and get emotion from music. Music is art. And art is using your imagination and creativity to express your feelings and emotions through auditory forms. So if we do not feel what you're doing, then you failed. So you have to allow us to feel what you're doing and what you're thinking at that moment, OK? So what I want to do now is I want to start critiquing some music. So uh, and the purpose of this is to really see what you guys are working on. I want to see what your ears are thinking. And I want to help make your songs better. And I want other people to learn from uh, my uh, little, you know, little uh, tips and tricks, OK? So I have, I can play it from any source. I have quarter inch, I can hook up a hard drive, I can open up a Pro Tools session or a Logic session or whatever, but who's first? And this is always the hard part. The first one to raise their hand right now. Who's first? I'll go first. Okay, let's give it up. track was hot. I would just make minor variations to that. Like I was just telling them with the horns, I would just change one of the chords in there uh, because I repeat it too many times. But that's not even, that's minor. And the triplet with the kick, that's, I never really heard that a lot uh, with hip hop. One thing you should do with that is put it on a separate track. And remember in class how I told you about dynamics? Those should not be the same level as your main kicks. We call those little kicks and lower them as a real drummer would. You understand what I'm saying? So those should be lower because dynamics is another thing that new music is lacking. Everything now is one level. And dynamics are when you have lower kicks and louder kicks and louder snares and lower snares. Same with the hi-hats. If you add dynamics on those kick triplets, and added the, the one note to the top, then I think that would be a hot beat. I mean, it sounds like, uh, oh, it sounds like, it reminds me of the stuff we worked on yesterday, like right, straight hip hop. Who else do we have? Yeah, you ready?
I would have loved to hear a rap on that. I like that this track. I don't know what genre that is. What genre would you consider it? You don't chill out. That's, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. And every time I try to create a track, something different, it I think no genre, just make music, and that's what I feel with that. That's why I ask what genre would he consider it, and he just said he didn't have a classification for it, which is great. That's thinking outside the box and just making music what your heart is telling you to do. And that's why I loved it, and I would love to hear a rap on that. That would be great. So I have a few minutes for a Q&A if you guys have any questions or, yes? So in your opinion, would you say the analog era was better than the digital era? Yes, of course. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love digital because it's so convenient. I love the fact that you can just hit a button and everything recalls and comes back exactly how you left it. But the difference is it's making a lot of new producers not do what we did to keep it authentic. Like how I just explained how we created our own sounds. Now they come prefabricated. If you use a combination of analog and digital, you guys would be incredible, analog and digital. Listen to it, even if not from a record, like what I did yesterday in class when I made that track in, what, 20 minutes? I have my record collection digitally, so I have it in Dropbox or wherever I am in the world. I can download sounds and create them, and I can put, put them anywhere. So, you, yeah, so you, you, you have to, 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 to mix them. And the stuff that I sampled was all analog music. You know, what I- What would you say as well with the digital sort of, everyone would sort of get digital set nowadays, kind of, it's not as easy enough to get the software and things like that. Would you say that sort of played a part into how hard it is to get into the industry now? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, I think, oversaturated because a lot is so easy to get and so easy to make right now, but people don't realize there's a difference uh, in uh, taste of music. There, you can either buy a uh, Honda Civic or a Mercedes Benz. So same with beats. You can buy, anyone can make a beat, but is it a great beat? Is it a great song? You know, so there's a difference. Everyone can do it. I can, uh, you know, a five-year-old can make it with the, with the programs out now, you know? So... Do you reckon that's what's made it sort of like, see what you were saying to me earlier about how sort of like restricted people need to protect themselves to sort of think about Oh, yeah, yeah. Era, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, at the same time, the digital era there, is, uh, I'm, I uh, speak strongly about this. There are definitely pros and cons, you know? Like, I love the digital era, but it's also affecting uh, uh, us creatively. The creative people is affecting us. And another thing that the digital era is doing, it's um, allowing, which is also a good thing, but it's allowing creative people and artists to go directly to consumers. That's why a lot of songs make it to the top of the charts that are not hot to us. We don't really like it, but it, yeah, but it gives the artist an opportunity to go straight to the consumer directly and bypassing how it used to be by the label. You know, going through a label, which you have artist development, you have quality control, you have A&Rs and executive producers, and making sure that we put out commercially satisfactory music as opposed to just someone doing a song in their bedroom and putting it out and, uh, you know, and then... Yeah, then, yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, it has its pros and cons, yes? You know, like, for a lot of people, like, producers, musicians, I mean, one of the hardest parts of their careers is actually just, you know, getting out there, like, getting your name on. Yeah. For you, what would you say was the hardest part of your career? The hardest part of my career was uh, my own, I had my own fear. Everyone has their own battle. And my fear was I was thinking I was being looked at um, and I was getting scared that I couldn't live up to what pe people's expecta expectations like, people looked at me like, wow, he did this and did that. And that's why I stopped doing public publicity. Because um, you are your worst enemy. You know, you are the one to, to, to uh, if you fail, 
you can blame, don't blame anyone or point the finger. It's because of you, and if you win, the same thing. And that's one of the biggest mistakes. I was shy and I was a little reserved and hesitant, and I didn't really take, take it as far as I really could have. But I was content because my passion was making music. And another big mistake, and I can say this publicly too now, because uh, I don't really care what they say, uh, but I got a call one day from Mariah Carey and uh, Tommy Mottola to, hey, Tony, yay, I, have my, I got my wife on the line. She want to talk to you. I was like, OK. I'm like saying to myself, how did this guy get my number? So <laughs> we're on the phone, and he said, hey. She says, hey, Tony, I love your music. I'm married. Hey, can you come to the studio tomorrow and produce a song? And I said, OK. And I didn't show up. <laughs> and you know what, I'm kicking myself in the butt right now because the song was Dream Lover I was supposed to produce. And it went eight times platinum. But, you know, you learn from your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. I was young and dumb. <laughs> you know, you're young, dumb, and you have a lot of money, what do you do? You do whatever you want to do. Yeah, that story, I never said that, told anyone publicly, but it's, it's a great experience, you know. Don't make those dumb mistakes. Well, you have to make dumb mistakes in order to, to be great. You have to, in order to be great, you have to make mistakes.